Some people say there's always a cycle in trends between every 20 or 30 years. This also applies to the music industry, from vinyl records in the 1930s to cassettes and CDs from the 60s, before the streaming services took over in modern times. But old formats are gradually making a comeback over the past decade, as people study and search for their physical pressings in their yesterday. Inside one of the skyscrapers at the heart of Causeway Bay, there's this hidden gem which removes you from the hustle and bustle of the city. Every visit to this museum is just like a time travel experience, taking you back to the 1950s or 1960s as you learn about the history of the vinyl records and listen to what the owner says is the music's DNA. It's great to see you again. You're welcome. Wait, what is this music? It's favorite. Mamma Mama Mia. Mia is one of my favorites. To understand why the vintage vinyl is making a notable comeback, we turn to James Town, owner of the Record Museum in Hong Kong, which opened eight years ago. His 900 square foot space is now home to a collection of some 20,000 aging vinyl records, cassettes, and CDs ranging from the Western sphere to local legacies, including some 700 master tapes. So this is a master tape? Yeah, this is a flagship of the era that uh, introduced to the, to the studio at uh, 1970 uh, by Swiss uh, most famous brand uh, studio, it's the A80. How it works is like a giant woman, all right? <laughs> it's very big fun. You know, it can spin 11, right? Rewind wow. in very high speed. <laughs> when I operate, I feel like a producer. And you stop it. And then you can start to play back. Okay. All right, so this is my very first time, like, holding a vinyl records. So this is La Croix. I can smell the, well, like... Painting. The yeah, 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 yeah. The painting of 60 years ago, the smell is still here. <laughs> Couldn't you believe this? That this time travel also. Yeah, definitely. He must be holding this. I also hold this. <laughs> so, with the song he sang, and then, and time, and thing. And this is a very special one. One side means uh, basically can use for production if two sides cannot make for production. So, one side. And 12 inch, 78. RPM. I was so lucky that on the on a, on an auction in, in America, so uh, 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 one of the auction from the uh, Mackin Cole's family, uh, the wife uh, uh, Maria Cole passed away two zero one four. I got a few hundred pieces of uh, collection from Mackin Cole family. So this is one of the her autograph Maria Maria Cole. You cannot just put it aside. Nothing happened. This is culture. While there's no comprehensive data for record sales in Hong Kong, a report released by the Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA, suggested 41 million records were sold in the United States last year, amounting to 1.2 billion US dollars. It was the first time vinyl records outperformed CDs in 35 years. The sales volume was also 45 times that from 2006 and extended the growth to a 16th consecutive year. The momentum remains strong with sales up by 21% young year in the first half of 2023. Why do you think like the young people are now returning to the original medium of uh, the, 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 the musics? And uh, why do you think we're seeing uh, such a revival? As well. Since the introduction of the digital music media on the 1980s, early 80s, it has been about um, 30 years later, and people feel they are different. They are, they are getting tired of the harsh and cold sound without life, without soul. And they think before the song they heard, it's not like that when they are kids. So they are searching for the feeling. Actually, listening to vintage music especially is a kind of searching for feelings, like the vintage grandma recipe. So they don't need any 
fusion on it, okay? So they, they want to go back to this memory. That's why they want vinyl to come back. That's a new market. For James, nothing is more important than sound quality. He believes that it's better preserved in older records, making them more cherished today. Referring to them as the Mona Lisa of music, James does not stock vinyls produced after 1993, as he believes older records were closer to the regional score, without any enhancements, which he described as sound pollution. Can you also tell us about the differences between the master tapes and now, you know, the different kind of medium that we're using and seeing or uh, listening to years. now? I'm so curious to pursue the ultimate sound. Then I've been thinking and thinking, is it on my vinyl? Is it on my CD? On my cassette? I start to draw on uh, papers and on hundreds of papers. The the, the sequencing of sound. So, this is a finalized one, a master tape. How a record was born, it wasn't born right away. So, it is a family tree that I built. One, two, three, four. The, the second generation is these guys a Lequas, Open Reel, Egg Trap, Cassette, VHS. So, we label it the son direct from the mother. The mother, the son, great grandson, great great grandson, maybe more good grandson. No matter how good, your sons look like you more, or your great grandson look like you more. But there's someone who said he's more handsome. We don't know. We're not talking about handsome. We are talking about his mole still there. Copy the daddy. You mean the root? Yeah. <laughs> With years of experience, James has summarized his own theory of sound quality, naming it the music's DNA. His conclusions are drawn from his vast collection and after listening to music, produced and recorded in different formats. From day one, 100% master tape, to lacquers, to open real VHS, down to the um, Blu-ray technology. If the same song, Blu-ray only can copy five to five percent of the quick, 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 quick power. But it's high tech. But we don't need high tech. We want the flavor. And uh, also speaking of the customers here, is there any age trend or features among them as well? Are there are they more younger generations or? Of course, they're more younger, like a, a twenty something. You know, even student, they join the game. Um, since I uh, offer the free vinyl classes to the public, there are many youngsters come to learn. They, 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 they're so smart that they, they hear, they heard the old vinyl sound, how it sounds, the new vinyl, how it sounds, the Japanese vinyl, how it sounds. They learn the tricks, how to play from nine to nine years old to 90 years old. Everybody can learn it. Who was your like youngest customers? I told you, uh, one month ago, a, a, a little boy from Beijing is unbelievable. He's nine years old. He came with a, bro uh, a father and a father's uh, brother. And they both are not uh, music lovers and they love for Beatles. And then I thought he would might just take some cheaper sample as a practice. And he want to buy something really nice and strongest flavor. Then normal, even adults, will take the LP, the first edition LP, the Beatles Red Final LP, even the CEO, those richest collector will talk this. No, he won the 45. He was so little. My 45 on the very lower section, not many people there to touch it. It's my own toys. He touched and touched. He saw the display. Hey, Jew, and let it be. He took two. Wow. He said, Side B, the revolution sounds very good. He was only nine years old. <laughs> How he learned it? Steady is not about music. So even he, they both have uh, enjoyed the class. He said, oh yes, it sounds warmer, the vintage vinyl, uh, uh, there are difference, but he's not on that field. This, but the little boy was seriously, like a, like a 50 years old experienced man. 
industry analysts say people born between 1997 and 2012, or the so-called Generation Z, are more likely to buy vinyls. New artists, both local and overseas, are also riding the wave of the vinyl renaissance by releasing their music on records. The pandemic in some ways also served as a catalyst for the surging demand. According to the RIAA report, there was a remarkable resurgence in vinyl sales in 2021 after a mute ending a year earlier due to COVID. Did you see a major boost in sales during the pandemic? It seems that more people are you know, trying out new things. Were your business able to benefit from this pandemic as well? During the pandemic, um, there's no tourists. We lost the tourist customers, but people also cannot travel. What they can do at home, buy a turntable and listen to music. So a little balance. Every year, Christmas, people will receive gift as a turntable, something like that. So they need software, they need records. How much would a record, uh, you know, be l the prices of them be like oh, here? For my experience, uh, the most expensive record I sold on one piece is 100,000 uh, Hong Kong dollars. For one piece, one what piece is that piece? It's a high first a classical performer, violinist uh, from Russia, uh, high first uh, um, Beethoven violin concerto. It's not just an ordinary vine, it's a uh, studio, Japanese studio test pressing. It's only one of a kind in the world. So it sounds far better than the first edition and so and so. What was the price when you firstly bought that record? You need to have a sharp eyes. <laughs> if the price is too high, I will not pursue because I cannot afford it to, to keep so high price and wait for another client. So I need to uh, reach it within my budget and the, how much I love this piece of art. So I will pay for it and keep it. If nobody buy it, I have to prepare, I will listen it and keep it forever. For someone who wants to, coll who wants to collect re records as some sort of investments, how do they also increase the value of certain records? Nobody wants to make money. They love music. There are lots of things to invest to make money. Why records? They must love it. It's, it's their treasure to enjoy. Why I need to invest? Because I want more. If I don't sell 10, 20 percent of my collection, how can I generate and make the returning for more treasures? It's no choice. I cannot keep forever only buying. I need to share some of the treasure with the public. <laughs> While trading records is not a top priority for James, his main aim is to conserve this nostalgic treasure so people can connect with music's original form. Now with the borders open, will James take the opportunity to capitalize on a trend where more customers from the mainland and Southeast Asia are eager to hunt for treasures? We'll discuss more of his museum's operation and outlook right after the break. This is how I uh, clean the records daily. You just need some distilled water, some special high quality cleaning cloth, get some distilled water. And rubbing on the same direction on the roof. Operating a record store like this in Hong Kong may not be an easy task, considering the high rent and limited space. But James, who was born in the 60s, managed to turn his passion for pursuing the true sound of music into a lifelong business. So how did he do that? Among all of these like uh, items surrounding you, why the records? What does it mean to you as well? Uh, I was grown up with vinyl and cassette tapes since I was eight, nine years old. Uh, my family is huge, 11 members. There are two boys, my second brother and fourth brother, uh, a, a guitarist and a drummer found a band on the early 70s. Every weekend they practice rock music 
I was forced to listen, but I like it. Those rock songs, I can access their vinyl and cassette freely. When, about, when I was about 11 or 12, I used my pocket red puzzle money uh, to start to buy my own thing outside, you know, cassette tapes. The hobby developed into a passion, and the teenager gradually enlarged his collection of cassettes and records to about 1,500 items. Later, with an investment of 50,000 Hong Kong dollars from his brother-in-law in 1987, he opened his first record store in Wan Chai at the age of 25. Business has expanded since then, and the shop relocated to Sogo Center in Causeway Bay in 1993, Times Square and IFC in the 2000s, before moving to its current location eight years ago. At times, James has generated a turnover of millions of dollars. As for how he managed to source the vintage records, he said it was through years of treasure hunting in Sam Shui Po, as well as collaborations with some steady suppliers from overseas, notably Japan, which he said has the best quality of vintage vinyls, followed by the UK, US and Germany. The blessing from Japan are far better than other countries because they found a solution. At the end, they can pick up more notes from the mother tape than other countries. The Japanese are really, really how ridiculous. They how they do it? I don't really know. No. They will not disclose the secret. As Steve Jobs said, we don't copy, the Japanese don't copy. They reinvented, uplifted to more rich more enjoyable so that they can sell higher price, they can survive. You really have a wide range of collections, you know, ranging from the Westerns, music, uh, Japanese uh, music, Hong Kong music. So are there any specific treasures? Oh, this is my dream wall vinyl of frame. <laughs> you know, it's all the international superstar are right here, but it's top pleasing in the world. Many of them, no one ever seen or heard it. For example, uh, the Queen of Jazz, my favorite, Julie London. Julie. One of the candidates in 1964, Japanese first edition, test pressing on unlimited red vinyl. How, how much is it worth for now? 20K. 20K. And I saw this one, the Queen. I really like the Queen. <laughs> and this the Queen is really cool. This is a 1975 Japanese first edition and mean condition. So, uh, for the first edition, this is the king. What else? I also see Michael Jackson here. Uh, that's one of the best selling here, Michael Jackson. 1982, first edition, all certified, all the vinyl here. It is a special, uh, the Beatles Get Back rehearsal, uh, 45 RPM, unpublished mono version. Acetate. Unpublished unpublished, the one of a re rehearsal one time. So you can hear John Lennon, how he uh, practiced with his guitar and his tune, totally different from the official version. It's very meaningful. He falls so deep into this song. So this is only on acetate, so never published. It's one of the kind in the world. It's a, a piece of heritage and culture. So I want people can hear it. For Chinese song, that she's my favorite. Diva of uh, uh, Chinese pop, Teresa Tang. Definitely, this is one many of people her love her. Final concert at the NHK Hall in Tokyo, 1985, because it's the best selling of the best. Over the years, Candle Pop made a valuable contribution to the business during the German's golden age in the 80s and 90s. James says that Hong Kongers used to love Western music. Before singer and songwriter Sam Hoi heralded a new era unleashing candle pop. That inspired other emerging local artists such as Anita Moy and of course Leslie Chen, whose music is perhaps one of the most sought after. Oh, for Canton Pop, we uh, will prefer to use the cassette tape uh, that parallel released on the same year as a reference, top quality. As my theory uh, said, uh, if parallel release at the same time, uh, the second generation, the cassette tape, uh, 
far better sound quality than the vinyl, especially Leslie Chung's vinyl. Uh, the price, uh, like a, a seafood price, you know, every day is different. So after we sold the last one, we are not going to take any more of Leslie Chung vinyl. We focus on cassette tape. We have co almost a complete series of Leslie Chung cassette that many people never heard before in their lifetime. As now, actually, when Hong Kong finally opened its borders yeah. and actually more mainlanders are also coming to the city for yeah. traveling would you be able to some sort of like capitalize this momentum as well because more mainlanders they are also into those kind of cultural product products basically before the border was open we have a lot of collectors from china because they are social media it's worldwide actually some learn got to know me from youtube from facebook before they come to hong kong from britain from brazil from Australia, they said, I want to visit your museum. Can I come with my wife and we make a booking? There are so many like this. It's international, basically. I open the door for free listening. I'm happy. If they want to learn, that means my knowledge uh, can be sustained, will not be disappeared forever. People from around the world have visited the museum, and James has highlighted the location from where they came on a map. He also maintains a logbook for clients to leave their comments and suggestions. Most of them have expressed appreciation for what James has to offer and admired his collection. But for visitors from Canada, the name of his museum, Sam the Record Man, could cause some confusion. Sam the Record Man, there is another brand or chain in Canada and uh, in some Western countries as well. How would you react to this aspect when people have some, some sort of like controversial views yeah. regarding the, the issue? The story was that when we created uh, this uh, record shop on 1987, it was, um, I used 1,050 records and my sister-in-law, uh, in he, he appreciate my work, so he invested um, fifty thousand uh, dollars for me to open a record shop. He traveled around the world. He was uh, uh, a famous accountant, so uh, he must know more than me. So he said, "You are Sam. Then just use the name Sam the Record Man." I didn't know nothing about it. So he named he named me, not a name. So until one year later, a student from Toronto come back to me. Hey, we have a Sam in Toronto. I said, and show me the picture. Oh, really? Same name, but. We don't mean to copy them, but we have our way to uh, 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 introduce our music to the world. Yeah, is it the same? It's the same name, different, different way of a uh, business. The Canadian chain of Sam the Record Man, which was in business for nearly half a century, closed down in early 2000 amid declining sales and competition from music going online. Hong Kong Records and HMV Retail, which once operated stores in the SER, also pulled down their shutters in 2018. James earlier turned down an acquisition offer for his business from HMV Retail in 2016, as he had other ideas. What you're suggesting is quite against how the technology is, totally is, is, is advancing, right? Yeah. And also, it's also sort of against the mass market here when we are having the streaming music as well. We are very niche. Would you concerned about the future of such, uh, such I, products I don't, I don't or such to, preferences? I don't worry, worry about the concern, how I survive. I have no time to concern, no harm to worry. From day one, I keep going. If I keep going every, each day I survive, I'm surviving. I keep going, today I survive, tomorrow I survive. A new learner, a new visitor, join my side, I survive. If one year no one joined me, I start to worry. But so far nothing happened like this. Frequently be a new joiner, they are all repeated customer. After 20 years, they still believe this is the best. And so many academics, so many professors on my side. There's no way to forget the vintage or final, same as there's no way to forget the grandma recipe of cooking. Impossible. It is the power of Hong Kong, soft power of Hong Kong. So tell the world, we are here waiting for you to come to enjoy.